Welcome to the Teachable Moments series. I'm Pastor Darrell here at Reconciled Church LA. You know, on August 28, 1963, during the historical March on Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered what is, in my opinion, the greatest speech ever spoken on American soil, the I Have a Dream speech. In that message, Dr. King referenced, though subtly, a verse in the Bible that I'd like to explore in more detail. Why? Because the same injustices that Dr. King was fiercely objecting to 59 years ago are before our collective eyes today. However, the injustices are simply packaged differently. In the first episode in this mini-series on justice, I introduced two words that are central to this series. We talked extensively about righteousness and justice, the Hebrew word zadakah and mishpat. If you missed the previous episode, you might want to pause here, view that episode, and then resume this video. Again, Dr. King in his speech referenced Amos 5. As I analyze Dr. King's speech and Amos 5, there is a correlation between what God is doing in Amos 5 and what Dr. King is doing in his speech. Join me in Amos 5. While you're turning to Amos 5, allow me to provide context for the passage. Amos is a prophet to northern Israel. Remember, Israel is a united kingdom under King Saul, David, and Solomon, but became a divided kingdom under Solomon's foolish son, Rehoboam. Northern Israel comprised ten tribes, and southern Judah comprised two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Amos is prophesying in northern Israel circa 760 before the Common Era. As we transition to the text, what's striking about Amos 5 is that this chapter is a dirge, a funeral song, a psalm of lament. What's even more shocking is the fact that God is the author of the song. Not only is he writing this tune, but he's also singing Israel's funeral song. God is saying to Israel, when I destroy you because of your wickedness, iniquity, corruption, and sin, here is the song they will sing at your national funeral. Did you know that God is a songwriter and singer? Apparently he is. Let's examine Israel's funeral song together. In this chapter, God continues to make his case against Israel, just as he had in the previous chapters of Amos. Verses 1 through 3 introduce us to Israel's impending destruction. Verse 1 says, listen to this message that I am singing for you, a lament, a dirge, a funeral song, house of Israel. This verse identifies God as both the songwriter and singer of the song. The first stanza of the song is in verses 2 and 3. It reads, she has fallen. Virgin Israel will never rise again. She lies abandoned on her land with no one to raise her up. For the Lord God says, the city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left. And the one that marches out a hundred strong will only have ten left in the house of Israel. The destruction and decline of northern Israel is declared by the sovereign God. In the midst of declaring Israel's destruction, the grace and goodness of God is on full display in verses 4 through 6. This is what I call an invitation to live. These verses are pregnant with imperatives. As God instructs Israel how they might avoid judgment through repentance, there are seven imperatives in the text that will be bolded for you. Here's what God says. For Yahweh says to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel or go to Gilgal or journey to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into exile and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek Yahweh and live, or he will spread like fire throughout the house of Joseph and it will consume everything with no one at Bethel to extinguish it. In God's instruction, it's clear. God says, seek me, which is the only way to guarantee life and blessing. God distinguishes between seeking Him and religiosity. Religiosity is things like holy and sacred sites or experiences. 
God says, I'm going to destroy all of those sites because I am not found in places. I am found spiritually when you seek me with your whole heart. You know, history tells us that Israel did not heed God's advice. Verses 7 through 17 lay out God's indictment against Israel. Verse 7 says, Those who turn justice into wormwood also throw righteousness to the ground. Here are the two Hebrew words we've been highlighting. Righteousness and justice. Zadokah and Mishpat. God says you've turned Mishpat into wormwood. Wormwood is a plant that is very bitter to the taste and when consumed can be nauseating. The irony regarding wormwood was while it was bitter and nauseating, it was believed to possess a medicinal benefit to aid with digestive issues. Israel had turned the sweetness of justice into the bitterness of wormwood. Not only that, but they had discarded righteousness to the ground like it was trash. Verses 8 and 9 showcase the sovereign power and preeminence of God. The text says in verse 8, The one who made Pleiades and Orion, who turns darkness into dawn and darkens day into night, and who summons waters of the sea and pours it out over the surface of the earth. Yahweh is his name. He brings destruction on the strong and it falls on the fortress. Having established God's greatness and sovereign power over constellations, days, and judgment uh, of the mighty in their fortresses, the indictment continues in verses 10 through 13. Read the text with me. They hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate, and they despise the one who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him, you will never live in the houses of cut stone you have built. You will never drink the wine from the lush vineyards you have planted. For I know your crimes are many and your sins innumerable. They oppress the righteous, they take a bribe, and deprive the poor of justice at the city gates. Therefore, those who have insight will keep silent at such a time for the days are evil. God specifically lays out the charges against Israel. In verse 10, Israel hates when the guilty are convicted and they despise the elders who speak with integrity. Justice is perverted when the guilty are exonerated and the innocent are incarcerated. Does that happen in America? In verse 11, Israel tramples and overtaxes the poor. Is the American tax system designed to favor the poor or the rich? In verse 12, they oppress the righteous. They took bribes and deprived the poor of justice. Are the privileged and powerful in America buying politicians and persons of power in high places? Think about some of the recent scandals in the news. The misappropriation of welfare funds in Mississippi. The university admission scandal where wealthy celebrities sought to buy their kids' entrance in the prominent universities. When these injustices occur, the poor are ultimately deprived of what is owed to them by an honorable society. They are owed justice. Now, if politicians, policymakers, and public servants are being lobbied and bought and sold, then justice for all people becomes impossible. In verse 13, because those with insights, influence, and social power do not speak up against injustice, these same individuals will be silenced when God's judgment comes. In the midst of indictment, God pauses to offer instruction for Israel to change their future outcome. Again, God's instruction includes more imperatives for them to obey. Here's what the text says in verse 14. Pursue good and not evil, so that you may live, and Yahweh, the God of the armies, will be with you as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice at the city gate. 
And perhaps Yahweh, the God of the armies, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. There are two couplets here. Pursue and love what is good. Hate and do not pursue what is evil. Allow me to nerd out on verse 15. When God commands Israel through Amos to establish justice, He orders this command in the Hiphel verb stem. The Hiphel verb stem in the Hebrew is the active causative stem. In this verb stem, the subject causes the action of the verb. Therefore, the Israelites are commanded to cause justice to be established or to make justice stand firm in the city gates, which is where cases were brought to be adjudicated. Why is the Hiphel important to note here? All of the other imperatives in the text thus far have been in the cow verb stem, which denotes simple actions. God uses the Hiphel to underscore the responsibility of the Israelites to be the causal agents in rooting and grounding social justice in their society. In other words, social justice will not and cannot establish itself. It must be valued, safeguarded, and indiscriminately guaranteed for all people, by all people. As this section transitions from indictment to instruction, God now returns to the themes of verses 2 and 3 where he foreshadows the judgment of Israel and its horrible aftermath. Verse 16 and 17 read like this, Therefore Yahweh, the God of the armies, the Lord, the Sovereign One, says this, There will be wailing in all the public squares. They will cry out, and anguish in all of the streets. The farmer will be called on to mourn, and the professional mourners will wail. There will be wailing in all of the vineyards, for I will pass among you. Yahweh has spoken. There will be weeping, wailing, grief, and sorrow in the streets when God's judgment visits Israel because they had perverted social justice in the public square. The tone and tenor of this funeral song was a Jewish person's worst nightmare. The original intended audience might be thinking to themselves, well, this forecast sounds horrific, but perhaps the day of the Lord that the prophets told us about will deliver us from what God is currently predicting will come upon our people. God anticipating that sentiment obliterates that idea in verses 18 through 20. God says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion only to have a bear confront him. He goes home and rests his hand against the wall only to have a snake bite him. Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light, even gloom without any brightness in it? Israel and Judah envisioned the day of the Lord to be times of peace, prosperity, and prestige among their neighbors. However, because of their profound failure to uphold justice and righteousness, God says that the day of the Lord will produce chaos, calamity, and cursing. At this point, the Israelites are probably asking, how do we please a displeased God? We know we'll perform for Him. I mean, who doesn't like a show? We'll perform some of our religious rituals that always makes him happy, right? Not this time. God's anger and outrage over Israel's disingenuous worship takes center stage in verses 21 through 23. Listen, God says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I cannot stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings of fattened cattle. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. When there was no justice in the land, God hated, rejected, despised, and loathed Israel's solemn feasts, sacred festivals, sacrificial offerings, worship songs, and musical accompaniment. We cannot lift up holy hands in worship when we've got our knee on the neck of our neighbor for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. 
I know you get the George Floyd reference. Well, if God doesn't want our worship, ministry, and missions, then what does He want? I'm glad you asked the question. Verse 24 is an imperative of God's intentions. Verse 24 is the verse that Dr. King quoted in his speech. It's pivotal uh, in this passage because in it, God expresses either a mild command or a strong desire. My personal conclusion is that the context suggests that this is a command from God. He says, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. One final nerd session is necessary here. When God says, but let justice flow, the phrase let flow is in the niphal verb stem. The niphal de denotes uh, either passive or reflexive simple actions. In this case, I believe the niphal is emphasizing the reflexive nature of the verb stem. In the reflexive verbal action, the subject is performing the action of the verb upon himself or herself. We understand reflexive verbs very well in English. We use them all the time, and here are some examples. I dress myself. He brushed his own teeth. She drove herself to work. Now let's apply this reflexive aspect to the verse. God says that in order for justice to flow like mighty waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, it must be achieved and received by the people of God. It must be established and experienced by God's people. All of us are responsible to ensure that justice and righteousness are available for all people and are enjoyed by all people. That's the point of verse 24. So here's the teachable moment. Northern Israel, as the people of God, failed to heed God's warning through the prophet Amos circa 760 before the common era. Therefore, God sent the Assyrian army to destroy northern Israel and take some of its people as captives in 722 before the common era. In less than 40 years, this song that God wrote and sung was performed at northern Israel's national funeral just as God had predicted. When nations like northern Israel and the United States of America claim to be countries under God's sovereign and providential rule, yet deny His reign and rule by perverting justice and disposing of righteousness like trash as it relates to the marginalized and disenfranchised and ostracized, the poor, the foreigner, the widow, the elderly, and the disabled, history has taught us that God's judgment is not far behind. You know, Dr. King wisely said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I believe if we, the church, practice the mantra, if you see something, say something, we could accelerate the bending of the moral arc towards justice. I believe if we, the church, passionately prayed and prudently leveraged whatever platforms at our disposal and or peacefully protested injustices in our day, we could hasten the bending of the moral arc towards justice. I believe that if we, the church, really believe that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, we could speed up the bending of the moral arc towards justice. If we at Reconcile Church LA can come alongside you in establishing Zadakah and Mishpat, righteousness and justice in your world for the glory of God, please reach out and let us know. We'd be honored to help. Until the next episode, take care.